And about a few hours later, I got the letter. It was one of the most beautiful things I ever got, which was, she said, you know, every movement, every eye, every wiggle. She said, but not only that, just the person. She said, if my husband was here, he would say to Austin, hot damn, you are me. The number one thing with Elvis, and the journey was epic, and like, you know, there's a movie to be made about how Elvis survived the film. You know, you know, Tom, first day of rehearsals, COVID, all that, the film going away. Austin Butler, like, it was the most unusual experience, like, I don't know if you've heard, but I, you know, I told you I don't do auditions, I do workshops, it's a really precious thing when actors come into my world. I wanna make sure that we focus on the text. It's not like, I never go, you know, you're out. I just go, my job is to help you get this role. And I wanna work with you to try and find something in the text I didn't know. It was different with Austin. I don't know if you know, but he really felt he was sort of born to play the role and he, he made a tape and he thought it was terrible. Now, I didn't know for many years that, or for a long time, that he had lost his mother at the exact same year that Elvis had. And he has this dream, this really happens, and he wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and he, and he, he, that he's lost his mother again. And he thinks, oh, what can I do with this? He's always got this thing of what can I do with these feelings of fear or emotion. He's so driven in the craft. And he goes downstairs and he's in his robe and he plays Unchained Melody and sings it to his mum. And his agent sent it to me. I go, what is this? And I see him. And pretty much from the time he came in, he was down the road of Elvis. And, I mean, uh, I was clear pretty early on. I was like, the reason I kept the workshopping process going so long was just to prepare him, like, for the robust, for the giant hill that he was going to have to climb, getting ready to be dexterous, getting ready to be flexible. Um, because I knew once it got out there, the pressure on him, the kind of like, you, that, like, you know, I just was getting him ready and I was putting it off. And um, I also got a call from Denzel Washington, who I don't really know at all. And he rings me and he says, you are about to experience, he'd been on stage with Austin. You are about to experience a young actor whose work ethic is unlike anything you will experience in your life. And I thought that was so, such a big statement. But I was already experiencing it. And you know what? When the movie went away, Tom got COVID, I felt the, the film was gonna fall apart. And Tom was a bit like, look, let's put it off till February when this is all over. Uh, that was like two years ago. And I rang Tom back and said, look, I've done my research. I don't think it's gonna be over. And Tom bravely came back and all of that. But while he was away, Austin should have gone back to America and he said, I'm not leaving, I'm staying. And he doubled down on the work and he doubled down on the, the karate and, the, and finding every possible piece. Of, there's nothing that he does not know about Elvis. So I think what he did was, he did the craft thing, but I think he absorbed it so much that he was able to fuse literally his spirit and his soul. So it became not an impersonation of the most impersonated man on the planet, but it was an interpretation. So he's both absolutely incredibly observed, mm -hmm. to the extent that Priscilla Presley, who I met early, lost, was estranged from, and she was going like, how's he ever gonna do this? I, you know, she was worried, understandably. And then when I was, and she was not happy about what was going on, she was scared what I was gonna do. And other than that strictly boring screening, the most fearful screening in my life was I had to show Priscilla, and the plane was late, and I landed and I rang and they said, oh, the security guard's crying, it's a woman. I said, did she run from the room, is it? And he said, no, she's still in there, crying. And about a few hours later, I got the letter. It was one of the most beautiful things I ever got, which was, she said, you know, every movement, every eye, every wiggle, she said, but not only that, just the person. She said, if my husband was here, he would say to Austin, hot damn, you are me. And from that moment on, a whole new journey began, began with the Presleys. And one that I was unbelievably privileged to be part of. Mm -hmm. mm. And how on earth did you identify which songs to use? Yeah, well, it's like anything. I think personal taste is the enemy of art. <laughs> and what I mean by that is my choices, despite what people might think, are not really personal taste. Mm -hmm. Like my mission was to take someone who was really the poster boy of American pop culture for the good, the bad, and the ugly in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I was using it 
Elvis as a canvas to explore a larger idea. Not unlike Amadeus, I think, is about jealousy. It's Mozart, Salieri, it's really about jealousy. It's got a preposterous conceit at the center of it. Musically, right, it's not that it's all my favorite Elvis pieces. It's what pieces of music dramatically move the story forward. So, you know, I mean, obviously Suspicious Minds you'd want in there, but as it turns out, it's a suspicion between the major relationship in his life and, you know, he's caught in a trap and he can't get out, you know? And that trap is going to be that golden cage in which the colonel traps him in. So that has dramatic intent. There's lots of Elvis music I wish could be in there, but couldn't be. In the Cold Kentucky Rain, it's an amazing song, but we just didn't have a dramatic scene that was in the cold Kentucky rain, you know? <laughs> but you've got the most amazing <coughs> dramatic scene for If I Could Dream, which is my favorite Elvis yeah. song, so good job. Yeah, yeah, um, and d- all that's true, actually. Well, and I was just gonna say, so, so how much were you concerned <coughs> about the truth? Mm. I mean, I know you wanted to imbue the spirit of him, no, and the, no. but, you know, how do you divide between what's the myth, because what's I, the reality? Because I, mean, I do my homework, like, I live it. Like, I, and I can tell you something. I mean, there are, there are um, theatrical conventions. There's preposterous device. Mm-hmm like the colonel in a morphine dream arguing that, that the relationship of love, the real love story in this movie is not between him and, and Elvis, it's between Elvis and the audience, you guys, and you guys and Elvis. And actually there's some truth in that. If you've ever been a fan, you always want just one more movie or one more song or, you know, David, can't you just do one more album? But that, that means please remain a God, not a human being. Now, everything in that film I can point to and there's a reference for us. For example, like, uh, that line, I, I cannot overstate how strange he looked. That's what B- Buddy Holly said when he first saw Elvis as a kid on stage. And when Marion Kaiska jumps up like that, she didn't do it at Hayride, but the first time Elvis went on stage ever, nervous wiggling, and said to the guys, what are they screaming at? Right, that happened when he went on the band shell. And Marion Kaiska, who works with Sam, the, the record owner, the producer, goes, and it was terrible. The, he started to move around and he had the flappy cha- trousers on and of course things were going on down there and the, I was shushing the girls and it was getting noisier and noisier and all of a sudden there was this middle-aged woman standing up and screaming and it was me, you know? <laughs> well, you know? So I put that in there, you know? So there's a reference for everything that's in there and some, understandably, because I have to play really, really sharp hand of cards, you know, even, I mean, I had a privilege that no writer ever had. And that is, although you can go into the Elvis archives, like I said, I had an office and Angie Marchese was amazing. The Colonel towards the end of his life needs his money so much, he dumps all of his stuff in a truck and ends up selling it for $2 million and it's just thrown into Graceland. And it's not that well filed, but amongst it was a tape recorder and he loved taping himself. And there are these totally wackadoo recordings of him going like, so uh, slap a scene is, yeah, yeah, no, well, you know, and one moment, and the next one goes, uh, two ladies are perhaps, you know, he was always morphing. The size of the character of the Colonel, you cannot overstate, like his buffoonery, he's like a clown with a chainsaw, you know, like he is so large a figure that he would suck the air out of any room and control you by kind of humor. So just to give you an example, I don't go into it much, but the Snowman's League, which he formed, LBJ, the president, was a member of that. Like, he was just beguile you and manipulate you. And he's a curious, curious character because I had to talk to someone in a sort of serious, they were doing a serious breakdown of the movie. And they said to me, you know, I looked at that scene where the colonel's got his arms around Elvis in the closet. And you know, I really could see that when I saw it, he, he does love Elvis in that scene. But then I saw the movie again. I, I wanted to, and I thought, no, no, he's manipulating him. And I was coming to see you about it. I watched it again. No, 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 he actually loves him. And I went, no, no, it's actually both. He loves him, but he can't, he's like a scorpion and a frog, you know? He's a scorpion. He can't help but get, like he's built to, to punch the air because he got an extra penny out of a five-year-old for a stick of fairy floss where only half of it's on the stick. You know, so he's such an incredibly gigantuan character. And that's why I really needed someone like Tom to step into the, mm. 
into it because you had to someone who's going to swing big because you see in life sometimes characters are even bigger than actors mm -hmm. you know